Well, I'm still busy as hell. I'm starting to look like I'm growing an afro, and today the power went out for four hours. It's time for the Wood Whisperer. Welcome to episode 21 of the Wood Whisperer video podcast. I'm your host, Mark Spagnolo, and today we're going to kind of do a hodgepodge of a few different things. Uh, I've got some work to do still on a step stool project. Uh, I'm on model number two, essentially, and I've got some work to do there. And uh, I can show you the other project that I made is a little Japanese, um, you know, cocktail table, I guess, just a little tiny end table. Um, and I'm at the point that I need to put some finish on that, so maybe I'll show you the type of finish that I'm doing and the technique that I use to apply it. Uh, so let's get started with, uh, with the step stool. Okay, now in a previous podcast, I showed you how the step stools, um, the actual step itself, uh, sits along the side piece like this. So we've got some odd angles. And a real big issue to contend with here was when I put this piece of trim on the front of each step. Now, since I have a 10 degree angle on each side, I basically cut my little piece of trim here at a 10 degree angle. The problem is that's when it's sitting flat. But when I glue it to this piece in the front here, I actually have a 65 degree angle on the front of the shelf. So when I tilt it back, I'm essentially left with uh, a compound angle on here, which is not how I cut it. I cut a perfectly normal 10 degree angle as the piece was sitting like this, perfectly square. So let me get a few close-ups here for you. And I don't have my beautiful camera lady with me today. She's traveling, so bear with me as I move the camera around and do some things I don't normally do. Uh, so yeah, let me show you this. It's really cool. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a 10 degree slope in this direction toward you. Um, and of course, like I said, I cut the 10 degree angle on here. So at first you would think that's okay until you start to actually see there's no gap. And I'm going to get out of the way so you get a nice white background here. Watch what happens as I hit the trim. It lifts up. Okay, so we've got some material here to remove. And it's too late at this point. My joinery is cut. I don't, I'm not going to put this back on a saw. So I have to go to the more Neanderthal methods and use some hand tools. And that's what I'm going to show you today. You got this little piece of material here. How do we get that off? Okay, this is how. I'm going to use a chisel. Now the technique that we're going to use for this is called pairing. Can you say that with me? Pairing! I love raviolis! Well, that's enough. Uh, pairing basically means shaving off uh, just a little bit of material at a time. Um, instead of using more the, you know, what you might be familiar with with chisels where you're chopping at it, you're actually just shaving a little bit of material off at a time. Uh, you're going to need a really good sharp chisel, uh, first of all. And for me personally, when I do pairing, I like to have a nice reference surface that I can actually put the back, which should be very flat, the back of my chisel on and kind of make it just a no-brainer uh, you know, process. I don't, I don't really want to think too hard about it. I don't want to have to rely too much on manual dexterity. I want to take all the, the human error out of it as much as possible. So having a nice flat back chisel and a nice flat reference surface to work with makes our lives a whole lot easier. Uh, so let's get started and uh, we'll, we'll take some of this material off. Okay, now there is a 10 degree slope toward you. And of course, this is 10 degrees down, but here's where our fending material is. And you can see that by me using my thumb to hold this down on the surface. And as I scrape it across, once I get to the point where that wood is, I kind of do a back and forth, a little bit of a sawing, slicing action as I push forward. You can see the material I'm starting to remove. That lets me know, because I'm referencing off of this flat surface, that lets me know that's the stuff that I need to, to get out of here. Now obviously when I do this, safety is a huge issue here. I could very easily slip and if my finger is in the way, I may get a cut or something or I may stab myself like I did earlier. Um, so the key is as I do this, I want downward pressure here, almost to the point that I could let go with this hand. Um, and I'm keeping my fingers, I've got to keep them here for leverage, but I want them below the surface. So if I do slip this way, my hands down below, okay? So just bring some common sense to the table here. Um, and again, I'm gonna keep sawing back and forth like this. Okay, now the one issue you're gonna run into is this is end grain right here. So as I get to the end, I could very easily pop those little pieces off. 
So what I do for that is uh, I very carefully use the chisel and I actually chamfer the edge and I go around and I kind of try and slice with the grain so that I don't wind up causing myself more problems. Come around to this side. Okay. And I can use, I can get rid of quite a bit on this side because the most material needs to be removed from that top corner. Okay, so if you slice the corner like this, you slice that edge, give it that little chamfer, the material isn't going to tear out when your chisel goes right up to that edge. So we can be a little bit more confident as we start stroking all the way through like this, the pieces are just going to fall off because you're not actually touching those last little pieces of grain. So again, apologize for the camera movement, but my camera is actually sitting on the workbench right now. So usually I just take this sort of slow, methodical approach and I go back and forth, a little slice here, a little slice there. Now as I go, you can see it starts getting thicker and thicker, the actual amount of material that needs to go away. So I can keep going like this or if I start to see it, it gets to be too thick, it's a pain in the butt, I'll just come back and remove some material this way so that it makes it a little bit more, a little easier by the time I get to that point. Okay, so again, a little bit at a time, and in a few minutes, we will have a perfectly flat surface, which actually is now technically, it's a compound angle that's perfectly cut. Whoops, I got a little bit of tear out there, that's okay. We're going to have some sanding to do anyway. Okay, get that last little bit here. Okay, now as you go, you may need to re-establish that chamfer to make sure that you don't screw it up like I just did. Okay, now come back this way. And just that last little bit, just be very careful. And notice I'm not really chopping. I'm, I'm trying to rely on this being razor sharp and I'm slicing. Okay. And then once it's done, I push down really hard and I go back over it one more time. Because chances are I did wind up lifting a little bit as I went. So I'm using, once again, my reference surface pushing forward until I feel it catch, and then I'm giving it a little bit of a twist so that it slices away. Okay, and by the time you're done, look at that, you should have a nice, even, flat surface, which is gonna fit perfectly between the legs of our step stool. So once again, the key to this is a good sharp chisel and just taking your time, be as safe as possible. And for those of you who are wondering, um, if you see the wood that I'm working with here, this is a little strip of uh, lace wood, and this is quarter sawn white oak for the step. That's actually the material I'm using for the step stool, uh, the second version of the step stool. So now I'd like to show you the second project that I made for the wood show that's coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, we've got a walnut and alder, I guess it's kind of an occasional table, maybe a cocktail table, whatever you want to call it, but it's a Japanese inspired table, pretty simple construction, you know, very square geometrical design. The top is a really nice piece of walnut here with a nice chamfer on all sides and a little baby chamfer on the bottom and a pretty simple domino construction on the rest of the piece. Okay, so what I really wanna talk about here is the finish that I'm gonna use. Uh, you know, on a piece like this, you got a lot of choices. It's not that, you know, I think it's really personal taste, but for me, this is a very earthy looking project. It's, you know, these Japanese inspired pieces to me sort of, you know, they just beg to let the wood be wood. Don't make the wood plastic, you know, so don't coat it with a huge coat of polyurethane or lacquer. Um, let's put in, you know, something that's a real earthy type finish. And to me, an oil varnish blend is perfect for that. So I get questions all the time about what finish do I recommend. And, you know, it really comes down to personal taste and the function of the piece.
Okay, so this is going to be a relatively light use table, um, but I do want some protection and I do want to be able to feel the wood grain. I want it to be something that people just want to touch. They want to get their fingers on this wood. And that's how you know you've got a really good finish is when the first thing someone does is they want to put their hands all over it, which will drive you crazy, but at the same time it's a compliment. It lets you know that the wood doesn't look like the wood they usually see. It, this looks silky smooth and it begs you to touch it. Um, so the finish that I usually use for this, again, is the oil varnish blend, and that would be my recommendation for most people. The actual material that I'm using is a general finishes product. It's called Sealacel. Anybody who watches uh, Woodworks has probably seen this stuff before. David Marks uses this, which he's on the show almost exclusively. It's a oil varnish blend, contains some linseed oil. Um, there's always mystery on what these things contain and a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, but this is pretty much the consensus is that it is a mixture of linseed oil and uh, alkyd resin and also a urethane resin. So it's gonna have a, essentially an oil varnish blend. It's all you really need to know. The first coat I applied using a little sponge brush like this, soaked it all over the surface. I let it set for about 30 or 40 seconds, let it suck in as much as it wants. Um, the wood, when it's raw, is really thirsty for stuff like this. So keep applying it until you start to see it pool on the surface. And then after about 30 or 40 seconds, a couple wipes with the grain with a clean paper towel. Um, usually I just use paper towels even though it's got some lint in it. I'm not really building up a shiny surface here yet, so it's not a problem. Wipe off the excess and I let it sit overnight. And that's where we're at today. Um, you can start to see that it is starting to build up a little bit of a sheen, but the surface is kind of rough. You know, that, that first coat really was just a sealer coat. Uh, so we now want to actually start to build up a little bit more protection. And I'm only probably going to go three coats on this one. Um, so let me just jump right into to adding the second coat for you. Now before I get started, we can see that the surface is rather rough. That first coat raises the grain a little bit. Even though it was sanded to 180, we always get that little uh, grain raising action from all the broken fibers that are sitting on the surface. Uh, so it's important to make sure this is nice and smooth before we apply our second coat. So I'm just going to use some basic 320 grit. This is Norton 3X, just happens to be what I had stocked up on. And I'm going to use my, my bare hands here and just give it a few light strokes. I'm not really even looking for anything so much as feeling. I want to I wanna feel when the surface is smooth. And when it feels smooth, it is smooth. That's as far as I need to go. Okay, so as long as that feels good. Okay, now toward the end, I tend to um, use a little bit of a uh, sweeping technique. I don't like to go back and forth because you tend to focus on the corner a little too much. So when I get toward the end, I go across and I lift. And that's a good way to ensure that you get even sanding pressure all over that surface. Okay, we also want to lightly sand our chamfer here. Now I'll do this on the entire piece, but I'm only going to show you on the top because it's much easier. Nice big square piece of wood. And obviously this is going to take considerable, considerable more time on the table because of all the little tiny pieces. Now one thing I'd like to quickly address is the concept of, of sealers. I get a lot of questions on the website about whether, whether I should use a sealer, should I use a sanding sealer, maybe a coat of shellac as a sealer. All those things are fine, there's really nothing wrong with it, but in a lot of cases it's not really necessary. Um, you know, for an, a piece like this, we're going for a nice oil varnish mixture as our finish, you don't necessarily need a sealer. And the, the, I think there's a little bit of a misnomer in terms of the terminology here. Um, the first coat of any finish really serves as your sealer, so you don't necessarily need to buy another product and seal your wood. The first coat of this material served as our sealer. If you're using shellac as your finish, your first coat of shellac is your sealer. Same thing with lacquer. Um, there are a lot of other products on the market that refer to themselves as sealer, like sanding sealer. And sanding sealer is really just a diluted finish that has an additive in it that makes it easier to sand and less likely to clog up your sandpaper. Um, so you can use those products. Uh, there's actually some evidence out there that those sanding sealers, because of the material that's been added to it that makes it easier to sand, that actually can inhibit the absorption and the adhesion of your top coat. So 
I mean, if that's even a possibility, I'd rather not even mess with it. If I'm going to use a sealer, I like to use shellac, de-waxed shellac as my sealer. Um, it basically is like a universal binder for all types of finishes. But in this case, I didn't really see any reason to use a sealer or a, a separate sealer, let's say. So my first coat of this uh, seal cell was my sealer coat. So now we're actually going into what would be, I guess, considered in the process as applying our top coats. So now that we've done our sanding, we've got a little bit of dust on the surface to contend with. What's the easiest thing to do? A Little bit of compressed air is all it takes. Can you use tack cloths? Of course you can. Uh, but there are some cases where tack cloths, because of the resin that's on there, that stuff gets caught in the pores of the wood and sits on the surface, and it can cause finishing problems later. So in general, I like to avoid it. But in certain cases, you know, if I'm doing a super duper high gloss lacquer finish, um, I might use them just because I'm paranoid about dust. Uh, but in, in most cases, 99% of cases, I don't worry about tack cloths, just some compressed air. And one thing we always have to worry about with expensive finishes like this is the fact that we may not use it all for this project. So we have to figure out ways to extend the life of this material. Uh, you know, the varnishes and polyurethanes essentially cure via oxidation. That means our worst enemy is air. So the longer this stuff is exposed to air, the worse off it's going to be. And the, the you know, shorter the time period is before it starts to cure. So what I like to do and this is good to minimize contamination, is I use a, another bowl. I never really dip anything into the original container. Okay? Put a little bit of the finish in here. Don't put too much, because I really don't even want to pour this back when I'm done. I'd rather have to add more later. Put your cap back on. Okay, now we have completely minimized this can's exposure to air, which is good. Which is good, good, good. Okay, so now that I have my finish in my bowl and I get these things, you know, from swap meats and steal them from the kitchen. Okay, and I've got my finish ready to go. Got my little sponge brush and I'm going to apply the second coat. Okay, now the second coat goes on in much the same way as the first, so you really didn't miss a whole lot. Now, although that first coat as we mentioned, does seal the wood. You know, there's, there's different degrees of being sealed. It still is going to absorb finish. So I'm going to flood it on. And once again, let it soak up what it wants. Now, if you're in a rush, you can coat the whole thing. Um, obviously, you get the best results if you only work on one side at a time. I actually am in a little bit of a rush, so I'm going to coat the whole thing. And I'm starting with the back side, because if anything gets messed up, I want it to be the back. So I have it sitting on two little strips of wood. And there may be, you know, there's going to be some lines there when I'm done, but the final coat I'll do one side at a time. Okay, so I let that soak in for a little bit. You can see it's really wet. And it will take a little bit. You don't want to let it sit too long, though, because that varnish will start to set up. Okay, so at this point, just a couple light strokes with the grain using an old T-shirt. Okay, and that gets the bulk of it off. And then I go to a nice clean area of the rag, and I'm going to actually start from this end first. Come back that way. Now that is gorgeous. Okay, like I said, normally I'd let this sit for 24 hours, well, more like 16 hours before I actually contact this with anything, but I need to, this is out of necessity. So those two wood strips are probably gonna cause a little bit of trouble for me later, but it's a prototype table, so I'm not that concerned, okay? Repeat the process on the top, flood it on. And now we wipe off the excess. Now, on the finished side like this, okay, you know we've got material dripping down the sides, so we want to make sure we get that off, and I 
wipe down the chamfer first. Get the sides in the chamfer. So I wipe that first. Okay, and same thing we did on the bottom. Nice light strokes across. And the great thing about this is it's, I mean, really, I hate to use that term too often, but it's a dummy proof finish. You know, you're sanding between coats, so if there's a little bit of crap that sits in the finish, no big deal. You're wiping it off, so there's no brush strokes. And this is exactly why it, this is my go-to finish, and it's, it's the one that I recommend the most for beginners and people who aren't that familiar with finishing. It's a great way to get into it. How easy is that? So now I'm gonna let this guy dry probably 12 to 16 hours again, uh, give it a good amount of cure time. Then I'm gonna come back with some 400 grit paper instead of the 320. I wanna get finer and finer as I go. So I'll use the 400 grit, do the same type of light pass, it's not really gonna take very much, and then apply another coat in the same exact manner. Once that one dries, then I'm gonna come back with my 600 grit paper, get it uh, scuffed up again, make sure it's nice and smooth, and then I'll apply my final coat. And usually that final coat is so smooth, you don't need to do anything to it afterwards. Um, the final coat I'll apply in exactly the same way and it should go smoothly, no pun intended. Well, thanks for watching this episode of The Wood Whisperer. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can contact us at thewoodwhisperer at gmail.com. Now, in a couple days, we're gonna be leaving for Vegas and we're gonna spend about four or five days at the AWFS Wood Show. Uh, should be a killer time, it's gonna be a lot of fun, I'm gonna meet a lot of cool people. Uh, maybe I'll meet some famous woodworkers, who knows? We'll try and get some interviews, we're gonna bring the camera. Um, since I'm gonna be working, unfortunately all the pressure's on Nicole to try and get interviews and, and just get some good footage of the show. And we may even be playing around with a live streaming uh, webcast of the actual show from the floor. If we can get the technology to work, there's a lot of things that have to go right to get something like that to work. Uh, so until next time, happy woodworking, finish something, pare something down, just don't cut yourself. Your, your finish always seals the, the... Now as always, you can contact us as... Mother? Oh. Now over the next week or so... No, 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 no. To seal it properly ahead of time and, you know... Uh, we've got a lot of stuff with...